God bless you all. So happy to be here today. So I'm uh, Don Jonathan's uh, favorite dad. <laughs> it's strange to be among such good people. I'm not used to that. <laughs> I, uh, I do a lot of jail ministry and street ministry, so uh, my church is usually three meters around me. We call ourselves the, the walking church. My religion has legs. I, uh, I spend a lot of time traveling, going to different places, holding meetings, and my job, I think God has given me, is to train Christians to share their faith and not be creepy about it. <laughs> you know? Have you ever seen people share their faith? Um, I mean, it freaks me out sometimes how they do it. Their voice changes, you know? Hi, how you doing? Have you met the Lord? <laughs> well, hey, what just happened here? Eh? That, for, if, you know, if you go up to someone in the mall and you do that, it, it kind of freak them out because they don't understand your terminology. You know, there's people out there that are overly saved. Have you ever met someone that's overly saved? It's dangerous, you know? My wife was like that when I met her. <laughs> you know, she only had bed sheets on the bed, and she said Jesus was her comforter. <laughs> she would only eat pizza that had been delivered. <laughs> she wouldn't use a computer because it had a cursor on it. <laughs> so, you know, we pled the blood of the lamb, and today she's wearing short sleeves. Uh, <laughs> but, no, I, um, I came from a very conservative church, and um, everything was, it had to be done in such and such a way. I think my first drug is I was drugged to church. <laughs> I, I, I didn't go to church because I loved the Lord. I went to church because I had to. I went to church, and I never had a relationship with Jesus. I went to church, I feared God. And there's a, there's a good fear of God, but then there's also a dread, which is unhealthy. And if you're going to church because you fear God, you're not going for the right reasons. I go to church because I love Jesus. And uh, when you st in the past few years, something awesome happened. I don't know if it's because my daughter bought a gecko, and I saw that gecko shed his skin. And I've been shedding religion in the past couple of years. And I've been looking at how would Jesus do it? Why was he so attractive to people? And he, I never heard Jesus say a negative thing to a sinner. But boy, did he ever chew those religious people apart. Yet they lived good lives. Why was he against the religious people and he, he became a friend of the sinner? See, Jesus had something that was very attractive. And I said, I looked at how I was brought up. Jesus sat down, people, sinners were drawn to him. When I was religious and I sat down at the coffee table, everybody ran away from me. So I must have had something that's repulsive. Why, why was it that what I had was turned off sinners? It's because I thought I was better than them. See, Jesus, he came, the Son of God, he came to serve. And he didn't come here saying, hey, do you know who I am? He had, he had something that we all need, and it's called compassion. Religion has taught us that we're better, and we, it, it has given us this feeling of entitlement. And when we portray ourselves in front of sinners, it, we, we, we emit uh, judgment and condemnation. And that's repulsive. And that's why sinners don't want to be around us. So I thought to myself, I want to change this, and I want to shed every religious thing that doesn't belong in the body of Christ in my own life. And I started to take inventory. Where have we gone wrong as a church? Why is it that we have this exclusivity? And why is it that Jesus told off good people, and he welcomed the sinner? And I said, I want to, I want to be that. And it has changed my life. It's just, it's just an incredible thing. Now I actually, you know, when I was religious, I used to serve God on purpose. Now I serve him accidentally. <laughs> I get up in the morning, I don't have an agenda. I just say, Lord, I love you. It's one of the first things I say. Well, I say that to my wife too. <laughs> but she always says, uh, 
David uh, rose up early to pray. I said, stop your religious stuff, man. <laughs> Give me a kiss. No, but I don't want to be religious. I want to be normal. I want to be what Jesus was. And when Nathaniel asked Jesus, he said, Lord, show us the Father. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When Jesus was on earth, he portrayed the heart of God, love, compassion, and when Jesus touched the leper and the harlot and the, and the thief, he broke every law of religion. You see, we've been taught in strict religion and, and conservative religion, don't go out there, you'll get contaminated. Don't touch the things of the world, you'll get soiled. Jesus taught the opposite. Jesus says, I am pure. Whatever I touch will become pure. I am the light. When I walk into a darkness, darkness dissipates. That's contrary to what I've been taught. So if I'm such a holy person, why do I have to be afraid to walk in darkness? Why do I have to be afraid to touch the unclean? If, I'm, if, if, I, if Jesus said when he was on earth, he says, what I do, you'll do greater things yet. That's pretty far from religion and churches I was brought up in. Some churches I've been to, they haven't seen a, a miracle in years. I've seen some preachers, they're so dry, boy, they're sneezing dust. <laughs> and it's all this formality. They just want to preach and entertain people. I don't want to be entertained. I, I want God to move in my life, and I want to be a sweet savor. I want to leave an oil to be desired behind me. I want when people see me, they say, wow, this guy has something that I want. I always say life is beautiful. It's the people that ruin it. I don't even call myself a Christian anymore. The word Christian is mentioned twice in the Bible. We were mentioned, called Christians by those of Antioch. Uh, the word disciple, I think, is mentioned 240 times. What is a disciple? A disciple is someone who walks in the steps of Jesus, not just identifies himself. In the days of Jesus, when people, you know, when they said they, they were followers of Jesus, they became Jesus. Today, most people who say they believe in Jesus, they just believe he existed. If I go to a, a, a dairy farm, does that make me a cow? <laughs> you know, we have to understand that it's a transformation. Something happens. Yes. You know, I don't believe in the um, spectacular. I believe in the supernatural. Spectacular brings glory to man. Supernatural brings glory to God. And I think we need to be really concerned about that. We need to have such an experience with God that it radiates all around us. That's why my church is about this wide, because whoever I come across, I want to touch, like Peter, shadow, heal the sick. There should be something so powerful in us that when we go by, people say, wow, what happened here? Something amazing, and it's not about us, it's about him. For years, we've been, I've been listening to people, how do, how, do, how do we create Christians? How do we create Christians? When my wife and I became intimate, children were born. And when we become intimate with Jesus Christ, children will be born in the kingdom of God. We need this great intimacy. And to get this intimacy, we're going to have to get rid of stuff that don't belong in a believer's life. And we, we have to be sold out on what we have. Most Christians, so-called Christians, don't have a clue how to share their faith because it hasn't been made real to them. It's not head knowledge. It's, it's a heart condition. See, your heart has to be completely changed, your desires. And, and when you come in touch with that living Savior, you should never, ever be the same again. So sometimes when I go preach somewhere, I scare people because I don't preach like a deadhead. I, I, I preach like me, like what God has made me. I don't try to copy anybody. And I was called to Regina and I, they, or Yorkton. I, I think you were there that time, Nicole. And it was for the businessmen's breakfast or something, right? And, and this Randy King had asked me to, to give my, my, my story there. And he came up to me several times before and he said, Donald, stick to your story. Like, you know, don't, like he was afraid I would do something crazy. <laughs> and, uh, Sometimes I have a hard time sticking to my story. And then finally he came up to me, he says, you know, do what's in your heart. He says, I'll tell you why. He says, you know, we had a guy here years ago. 
And one of the pastors had invited him to give his story. And uh, he says, he kept going up to the pastor and he'd say, Pastor, I don't know what it is, but something in my spirit tells me that I should be dancing on a table in front of this. It's a banquet usually, right? So he says, Pastor looked at him, he was like freaked out and like, like who, this guy's crazy. Like, who did, we, who did we ask to speak here today? He's gonna he want to dance on the table. There's no table dancing here. <laughs> So he went up the second time to this pastor to scare him some more. He said, I don't know what it is, but I feel pressed in my spirit. God is telling me to dance on the table. So the pastor was really disturbed. He went up the third time. He says, I don't know, but he says, I just feel such, I just feel I have to do this. The pastor was like, you know what, do what's in your heart. If it's, if it's of God, he said, just do it. So he got preaching and telling his story. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God got a hold of him. And he started dancing on this table in this eloquent banquet. He did an altar call. Do you remember those? (laughs) Um, A woman came up to the front, and she was crying. She says, Pastor, she says, I've been trying to bring my husband to church for 20 years. He's so backslidden. And he says, the only way I'll go to your church is if I see someone dancing on a table. (laughs) And that day, that happened. And this is what I want to be. I want to be obedient. And I want to do something that's out of the ordinary for Jesus. I did so many stupid things for the enemy of my soul. I danced. I did everything. I submitted myself to the destroyer of my soul. And when I come to church, I'm going to be so pious and, and reserved and tamed. How does that? If the creator of the world comes into your life, how could you not feel that? How could you not feel that? And I'm telling you, you're going to react. It's just incredible what God does. You know, if we want to change things, you will never solve a problem with the same mindset you had when you created it. And the meaning of insanity, they say it's doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. If the church has failed, you know, I I see so many people telling me, I don't go to church anymore, there's too many hypocrites. I stopped going to the gym, there was too many unfit people. (laughs) What doesn't make sense, right? So why should it make sense that you stop going to church because there's too many hypocrites? I always tell people, you show me what what it is then. You show me what it is not to be one. See, people like to hide behind hypocrites. They use everything as an excuse to get away from God. But when we get to that judgment seat day, we won't be able to blame Brother John and Joe. and We give account for us. What have we done? So I was raised in a very uh, conservative church. It was so conservative that they were the conservatives on conservatives. I mean, we, my sisters had the same hairdo, I think, for, how old is she now? 50-some, right? They, they can't change their hair. They can't do this. They can't wear, uh, there's so many things they can't do. They can't do church. I don't want to go to a can't do I want to go, no, what will thou have me to do? So I looked at that. It stunk. I didn't want that. This had to be something more. And I'm not saying they were bad people. They were just restricted people. They were trying to outdo God. And that's a scary thing. You know, don't try to outdo God. Get God to do more for you than you can handle. And you'll find balance. You know, both sides of the ditch are wrong. So we can't find that middle ground anymore. It's either we're super religious or anti-religion. And I hear all kinds of people say, you know, they're so religious now. And and, and they all have these all these excuses, you know. I I, I hear it all. People say, "Uh," because when I tell people how I I share my faith, they say, ah, well, I use the gospel. I use words when necessary. That sounds so good. But so I feed the poor. I use food when necessary, you know. It doesn't make sense. I I want real things in my life. When I was on drugs, I felt my drugs. I felt my anxiety. I felt my fear. I felt my pain. I felt the lust. 
I felt all these things. Then I want to come into the kingdom of God and I'm not going to feel anything? There's drugs for that. I, I, wanted, I wanted my faith to be real. Yes. So I looked at religion. I said, that, that's, that doesn't appeal to me. And this is one of the reasons I went in the world. I went out there and I said, I'm going to live it up. I was about 15 years old, when I, I, less than 15. I said, I'm going to leave home. When I remember, I left my crying mother at the door. And she was just weeping. I said, Mom, I'm leaving. Could you imagine? You're just a kid. You're going out there. And she was worried, sick. And I remember she was just weeping and weeping and telling me, don't forget God. And I said in myself, I will never, ever, ever see your face again. The truth is not supposed to turn people off. It's supposed to convict them. And this is what's so beautiful about Jesus. Jesus is compassion wasn't judgmental and it wasn't condemning. It was, it was something caring and loving. And that's why sinners were drawn to him. See, uh, judgment and condemnation leads to rebellion. Compassion leads to repentance. Because compassion convicts you. And we need to be convicted to, in order to be brought to repentance. And repentance produces life. Rebellion produces death. It's like witchcraft. So I left home and, you know, one thing leads to another. I left some books in the back for all of you and make sure your kids don't read them, <laughs> especially good kids. Mm. My, but I, it wasn't created for kids. It was created for you and people in confinement centers and jails. But the tool has been very, very useful. I created a little cartoon book because God told me <clears throat> to look into it. There's 35 million Americans that can't read, 19% of them. Uh, don't have a grade five education. They've never heard of ACE. <laughs> and uh, so I created this book under the uh, God's, uh, uh, how do you say that? Like his, like he guide, his guidance, right? His, inspiration. Yeah, his inspiration. So we, I, I hired an artist and uh, it was really, really hard to do. Believe it or not, it's hard to make a cartoon with little bubbles that the story just continues and you don't lose, you know, like it's, it's really hard because that picture says a thousand words, <clears throat> yet the words that are in there have to be significant. So we prayed and it took two years to do this. I almost choked that artist in the name of Jesus, but <laughs> it was hard. But you know, today I look back and I know why it took, you know, things that take a long time to birth, they, they bear fruit sometimes, right? And uh, we've given out like 9,000 copies and in jails and all kinds of places and, and rehabs and on the street because I have a street ministry called Out of the Darkness. Every Tuesday uh, I teach believers how to make it a lifestyle, not just a Tuesday thing or a Sunday thing. So we go out on the streets and we hug homeless people. We hug everybody that has legs and some that don't have legs, but um, we just love people to death. And it's just incredible to go out there and we have a tool to work with. Uh, so we give this book to people that just need God so desperately, but have never had the opportunity. They're just broken. You know, it's so incredible. You see a big burly guy, he's maybe sometimes six foot four, and, and you go up to him and you say, hey, how are you doing? We're, we're on the streets today. We just want to love people, man. Can I love you today? Can I pray for you? And within minutes, they're weeping, and you're holding them in your arm. And, and if they stink, that smell has to become a sweet savor to you. You got to remember that everybody's someone's child. And, and I bring my, my kids. My, you know, people think, they, I've heard many people say, oh, you got such a great testimony. That's not true. Uh, my daughter has been doing street ministry now since she was 10 years old, and she has the greatest testimony. Because Jesus doesn't need my testimony, He doesn't need my dirt. Jesus, His intention was never for us to get contaminated. She has a testimony of purity, and you see, that's a great testimony that she's been preserved. So if you think you don't have a testimony today, that's wrong. Uh, we've portrayed that the, a very wrong way. Those who have not been tainted by sin have the greatest testimony. So people say, I can't go out there like you. You know, they always use that as a cloak, right? Why not? When I bring my daughter on the streets, she's, uh, when she was 10 years old, she would... People would look at her, you know, girls that have been abused and, 
and, and, and have lost everything because of sexual abuse. And they're looking at my daughter and they're seeing what they lost. And they're seeing what they would like to have, but it's been taken away from them. And they're looking at that in awe. And I know the guy who can press the reset button. That's amazing. See, what happens is if people that have never been contaminated, they go out on the streets. See, we've been really good in church at creating Levites and priests, but we have not created Samaritans. That's, think about that for a second. We've, we're so good, we're so holy that we go around the problem and we all have the right reasons to do it. They're there because it is, and we have, all the, we have a whole line of self-justification why we go around the problem. But we need to have that Samaritan spirit. We need to be righteous people that have a, a Samaritan spirit that stops and says, if I don't do something about it, who will? And when we have that, we're at a level where God can use us. So don't say, I can't go there because I've never been there. That's the one reason why you should go there. I don't want a drowning person to help me when I'm drowning. I want someone who's above and knows. I want someone who's in touch. Someone that's already holding the Savior's hand to take my hand and pull me out. And this is how we need to look at our faith. And this is how we need to look at what God has created us as believers, as disciples. Did Jesus tell Peter, yo, Peter, get down, man. You need to get out and sin, dude. He didn't say that. He didn't ask them to get dirty. He actually washed their feet. And you know what? There's no reason for you to get your feet washed if you're sitting in church. I need my feet washed. My daughter needs her feet washed because we go out there and we get our feet dirty. It's very significant. So I bring my whole family, Bella and Sam, they come and do street ministry with me as well. They've never been tramps like me, but they've got a great testimony. And you know, the funny thing is, is this, when I'm going down the crack alleys with my daughter, people say, aren't you afraid? The first question church people ask me is this, are we going to get stabbed? I always say no. Actually, if you want to get stabbed, go to church. But <laughs> sorry about that. We go down these alleys, and we don't look down on people. We lift them up. You know how beautiful it is to go up to someone and say, uh, hey, how are you? Hey, if you were to have a miracle in your life, what would that look like? 99.9% .9 of the people will, that's not a religious question to ask. Some people will say, I'd like to be a millionaire. Okay, let's pray. I don't shut it down. Oh, that's a stupid question. That's a stupid answer. No, there's no such thing. They're speaking out of the abundance of their heart. They've never been asked a question like that. It has, it has just given me an opportunity to pour Jesus into their life. And when I pronounce that name of Jesus, well, there's power. I don't care what they respond. They respond according to the knowledge of what they have. And some of them have nothing. I've learned so much doing street ministry. It's just been incredible. My wife and I renewed our vows. I was talking about that yesterday, three years ago. And, you know, I, I understood things about women when I renewed my vows. The first time I was so dizzy, I, I, I didn't know what was going on. Right? I, 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 I will, right? And then I ended up with three kids. But <laughs> this second time around, my eyes were open, right? And because, uh, like I said yesterday, marriage, love, is bl love is blind. Marriage is an eye-opener. So we're, we're, I went to buy my suit. It's a question of buying a suit is usually, what, 15 minutes, right? Is this, uh, what's your size? 40 regular, 32 pants. Thanks, bye. Right? We're happy, we're gone, we're going home. And then she went and bought her dress. Oh, my word. I, I had to pray about this. And we, we, I mean, we had family devotions about this dress. <laughs> she was at the altar, at every altar call for two weeks. <laughs> I, I mean, I walked into these wedding pla gown places. They, they, you know they have couches there? And a therapist? You know, you go in, like, you, you have your breakfast, and you, by the time you come out, right, you have delivery service for, for lunch. I, I mean, you sit down because you, you're worn out. I mean, I wore out my knees looking for this dress. So one day, did you order two or three dresses? Because, you know, she ordered them online, too. I think you ordered online, and I forget. But you should see her when she buys shoes. 
By the time we're out of the shoe store, there's a wall of boxes in front of us, and, and, and a sales lady burnt out to a frazzle. So anyways, we, we, we're going downtown in, in, in Winnipeg on Portage, and I can't remember what corner it was. So we're walking into this wedding gown place, and I see this creature on the ground that looked like E.T. Like, I mean, this person was absolutely, I couldn't identify if it was a man or a girl. or I, The nose was burnt to a frazzle. The ears were burnt. There was little plucks of hair and scabs everywhere. This person was burnt. So it crumbled on the ground, and the fingers are burnt off. And so my religious spirit rose up in me because I hadn't shed that part off yet. And uh, first thing I did is I reached for my wallet, and I pulled out $20. And I went up and I said, here's 20 bucks, right? Just feeling so, hey, you know, I wonder who's looking, you know? No, I'm just kidding. But I, you know, I just did what religious people do. You know, Catholics do it to get a better seat in heaven. I was just doing it to, because that's, that seems to be like the right thing to do. Then I heard a sweet voice, oh, thank you, thank you, God bless you. Wow, she's a step ahead of me. God, I didn't even say God yet, she's already witnessing to me. So I walk into this wedding gown place and I got a slap in the head. God just hit me. My ear's still ringing. And God said to me, you cheap Christian. I said, 20 bucks, God, I don't know. Like, I'm, like, I'm, just, I'm getting paying for this dress. So he said, is that all you can do? Is that all you can do? 20 bucks. I said, what do you want me to do? Take her home. I'm getting remarried, man. It's going to mess up my marriage. <laughs> but I started fighting with God. Like, what do you want me to do? And God says, you know what to do. So, okay, I went reluctantly out of my, the place. I said, okay, honey, I'll be back in a few hours. No, <laughs> I'll be back. So I walk out, and I went to my car, and I have these illustrated Bibles that are really awesome. It's an illustrated New Testament. And uh, I walked back, and I, I put another 20 bucks in, in between the sleeves. I don't do this all the time because it's not what I do. But this was an exception to the rule. And I went up to this, now I knew it was a girl, I went up to her, I said, I just want to give you this. She says, well, I know this book. I said, you do? She says, yeah. I said, well, can I sit with you? So I went like this against the wall, and I crumbled right next to her, and I started talking to her. I said, what's your name? She says, my name is, is Amanda. I said, Amanda, I said, what happened to you? She says, my boyfriend torched me. He poured gasoline all over her in this hotel room and lit her on fire. I said, oh, my God. I said, what happened after that? She says, I died. I said, I want to hear that. Said, when you died, what, what did you see? She says, I went to heaven for a very short period of time. I said, well, how was that? She says, it was pure, unbelievable joy. I said, Amanda, I believe you. I said, Amanda, I, I came here today to bless you. But I said, you're blessing me. I said, where do you live? She says, I live under the bridge. I said, how do you survive? She says, my nerves are shot. She says, I don't know if it's hot or cold. And then Jesus started witnessing to me. God told me, he says, put your arm around her. I mean, this was a sight to see. So I put my arm around her crusty body. I said, Amanda, can I pray for you? She said, yeah. And the minute I said that, she went like this. And I said, Jesus, I pray for Amanda right now. Just touch her. Let her feel your love and compassion. And the Spirit of God came down. We had a great moment in the presence of the Lord. And there alone, I felt like I had done a fraction of what God expects us to do. I went back into the wedding gown shop, and my life had changed forever. Not that I hadn't. I had been witnessing on the streets for 25 years before. But something happened. God spoke to me. And he said, you know, Amanda, you can see her scars. It was easy for you to notice there was something wrong. But he says, you go by people every single day that are just as burnt up on the inside, just as broken, and just as scarred. And you keep telling yourself, they're okay. It's not my problem. I'm saved, and that's all that counts. And it changed me forever. I will not see people the same way again. So I've determined that whenever I go somewhere, 
I'm going to touch someone's life in one way or another. And I'm not going to be creepy about it because I'm going to go there with the love of Jesus. We're saved to become the hands and feet of Jesus. And the devil has made us believe that we were saved for just to go to heaven. No, you're not saved to go to heaven. You're saved to serve God every day while you're here. Do you know the first words ever recorded in the Bible of Jesus? I'm about my father's business. That's the first recorded words of Jesus. How important and significant is that? And the last words were, it is finished. And if your first words aren't, I'm about my father's business, you will not be able to say it is finished at the end of your day. You will feel incomplete. You will feel like you have wasted your life. And many of us feel that way. Why am I saved? Why, what, what, what's there for me to do? Well, what's there for you to do is to be who God created you to be, and that's to share and, and just pour out your love into people and your compassion. And when you see someone that has fallen, to not look at him and say, well, he deserves it. He's an old drunk, and he, he made that choice. Not everybody has made that choice. Not everybody has made that choice. Some people were just born in a pile of manure. And it's our responsibility not to take them out. That's another thing Jesus told me. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. All you need to do is lift up the name of Jesus and represent him the right way. When I left home, I never thought that I would end up on drugs. It's the last thing. My mom had told me, if you take drugs, you'll jump off buildings, you'll jump in the traffic, you'll do this. She had drilled it into my head. So I met some people, my cousins, they were taking drugs, and I said, I don't want to take that. First thing I knew, they were like, well, look at us. We're, we're okay. We're not jumping off buildings. And for, through persuasion, you know, they say, tell me who your friends are, and I'll tell you who you are. First thing I knew, I was taking drugs. But one thing led to another. And the first thing I knew, I, I would walk into parties and people would look at me and they'd say, there's something different about you because the glory of God was upon me. But I didn't know that. But they could see it. So I said, I got to get rid of this stuff because they're recognizing me. I remember stepping on some guy's toe in this party. It was a drunken party of drugs and everything. And I said, hey, sorry, dude. He says, what do you mean you're sorry? He says, nobody in here says sorry. He says, you're different than the others. And I said, oh, he's can, he can see it too. I got to get rid of this. And wherever I went, people would come up to me and say, you're different. And I, and I knew what they could see. You see, I might have been raised in a religious church, but the glory of God was on me. And I couldn't get rid of that because it followed me wherever I went. When your kids leave home, don't pray God make it hard for them because you're opening up the door for Satan to destroy them. Pray God protect them. God be with them. Don't give Satan an opportunity to destroy your kids because they left home. Pray that God will preserve them from total destruction. So I did my best to get rid of that little boy Christian image. So I had to work hard, man. I had to learn how to walk all over again because I didn't walk like them. I didn't act like them. I didn't have the same vocabulary. I didn't even know what the Jets were or, or Habs. Or, I didn't know any of that because we had no television. It's not important. But what I'm trying to say is I had to get rid of that. And it, didn't, it took about uh, two years. One day a girl came up to me. And she says, I want to buy some drugs for you. I said, why did you pick me? She says, well, the way you look. I said, yes, I'm finally one of them. You see how stupid... Remember when Jesus told Satan, Peter, he said, Satan has the desire to have you so he can sift you like wheat. He wants to get rid of every good thing you have and throw you on the scrap heap. And this is what Satan does. He'll sift you like wheat till there's nothing left of you. So here, I look like a drug dealer. And I represented that. And I, I had to work at it to get there. And, and the first thing I knew, I was dealing drugs dealing with harder drugs and harder people, and, and it just went on and on. And the first thing I knew, I was losing my jobs. I was losing my health at a phenomenal rate of speed. And uh, I, uh, I was possessed with an evil spirit at one point so severely. 
I remember driving down the highway in a taxi. I had to hold on to the seatbelt not to throw myself out of the car against my own will. I would fall into trances. I would go to bed at night. My body would fall asleep and my spirit would hover over me. I would jump a foot in bed and I would pray because the Spirit of God was still hovering. And I'd say, Jesus, one day if, when I give you my life, I don't want to ever forget how horrible it was so that I'll never come back here. But I would go right back at it. And the first thing I knew, I was dealing drugs and I remember people coming up to me and they'd say, you know, you're a good dealer, Don, but you need to get into some bigger game and start selling some more drugs. And I remember one of my biggest drug deal, the first large one that was significant in the 80s, a thousand bucks was a lot of money for a drug deal. And uh, for a first drug deal anyways. So I had a, a pound of gold sealed hash from Pakistan. And this Colombian says, I'm gonna take you to this ghetto. But he said, show no sign of fear. And uh, so I walk into this ghetto. It was a horrible apartment building. And uh, I mean, it's, it, you have no idea what you see in these places. You see people that are literally rotting alive. And we knocked on this door and we walked into this house. There was a skinny little fellow who looked like John Lennon. And uh, so I walked in, I thought, he's not too scary. But what I saw after is what scared me. There was a baby there with uh, about two, two pounds of crap in his diaper, no food, no furniture. And he yelled out, hey, come out of the room. So he's talking to his, his what they call his hoe, which is she works the street for him. So she works the street and she's a drug addict, and they're both working to support this drug habit, and there's children born in the midst of this. So she came out when there's nothing in this house. It's just a slum. And she put out $960 on the table for, for, the, for, the, for the hash. And, and God spoke to me, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And it hurt me to see that people were raising their children in such an environment. I look at your baby, it's awesome, isn't it? The last thing you want is to see your kid in that environment. But these children, they're born in it. How are they going to know how to say thank you and, 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 and be polite or respectful? When you do street ministry, these are babies that were born in there. And you go up and you give them a gospel or, or love, and they reject it, and you get offended? <laughs> Why should you be offended if someone that had no education say something stupid to you. It's like me, if I'm going by a jail, right, and I'm walking the streets, I'm free, and I'm walking in, and there's a jail there full of inmates looking out the window making fun of me, does it matter? <laughs> I'm, supposed, I'm the free guy. So if you're witnessing to people and they're telling you stupid things, does it matter? You're free. So why should you be offended? So I learned these things. You know, like I was out there and I, I considered, I said, what am I doing here? I felt like the prodigal son. And when everything broke down in my life, I ended up with the pigs. I mean, I literally ended up with the pigs. The only difference is they had two legs. I was broken. My life was an absolute fiasco. And no man gave unto me. No man. And I thank God for that. Sometimes the best kind of love is tough love. No man gave unto me. And the Bible says when the prodigal son went into a far country and he wasted his life and his substance, no man gave unto him. Am I right? Then he came to himself and he says, how many hired servants my father has. I sit here wanting. He was fighting with the pigs to get the husks. He says, I will arise and go to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and home, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. See, sometimes we give to people, and it helps them. Sometimes we don't. We have to walk in the Spirit. And no man gave unto me, and I, this is what happened to me. I started to reason. I came to myself. I came to myself, and I looked at my home that I had left, it might not have been the perfect picture, but I knew that they had something I didn't have. And I said, I will arise and go to my mother 
and say, I've sinned against heaven first and against home, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. And this is the beautiful thing about the prodigal son story is when he got up, there was action. I mean, repentance is always action. He got up and he went to his father and his father came running and fathers in those days did not come running. And I believe the reason the father came running, it was a shame for a man in those days to run because of dignity. His father came running because the villagers of his town had the full right to stone him. So the father came running, so to speak, to stand between the prodigal son and the town villagers to cover him from those stones. And he kissed his son. And the repentance was so deep. Most kids today, when they come home, if you kiss them, they'll never repent. They'll say, hey, I don't need to do it. He's accepted me the way I am. Even after the father kissed him, he still said to the father, Father, I'm not worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of the hired servants. So he got home, and the father killed a fatted calf and made merry. And there was an evil servant in the house. And there's many, many evil servants in the house. Most of the troublemakers are in the house. So the evil servant went out and he said to the evil son that didn't realize what he had. And he misinterpreted the father. He says, because your father found your son safe and sound, he killed the fatted calf. But you see, that wasn't true. The father did not kill the fatted calf because he found him safe and sound. The father killed the fatted calf because he came home repenting. There's a big difference. Don't kill the fatted calf because people come home safe and sound. Only rejoice when they come repenting. And his repentance was so real and so deep that even when the son came in to test his repentance, he never backfired. He didn't say, move over. Jesus accepts me the way I am. See, repentance is something that leads you to life. And it don't matter what people say. When you're repenting, I remember when I came home, boy, I had lived like a human trafficker. I had lived on the streets. I had done crimes that I should be hung for. When I came to myself and I came home, nobody could offend me. All I saw was Jesus. And Lord, how do I get my life back? You know, I, uh, I, I've seen things in my life that I could never unsee. I've d done things in my life, and I'm not here to promote any of that. But you know, I remember one day going up to my hotel room, and God deals with you in so many different ways. And, I remember going up to my hotel room and I, I, I was selling crack cocaine and we were on top of this. We were running this hotel and I was dealing with the top human trafficker in Canada. And he became my partner and through crack and through the, the trafficking that we were doing and we were running this hotel, big hotel. And I, I was at the pinnacle of my career and I was living in this, this loft and then I went up. And as I went to put the key into the keyhole of the door, this evil power just overtook me like I had never, ever done before. I lost complete control of my faculties. I remember this as if it was yesterday. This, it was so dark and so horrible. My hands started aiming towards my eyeballs to pluck my eyeballs out of my head. And I was absolutely traumatized and I wanted to scream. And I thought if I start screaming, all the gangsters will come out of the room and they'll say, Donnie lost it. Then I'm going to lose all my turfs. I'm going to lose my reputation. So I was battling, and my hands were getting closer and closer to my face. And I thank God for mommy's prayers because they work. And I leaned against the wall like this, and I just crumbled to the ground, and I'm just fighting this, and I'm unable to control myself. And I said, God, I promise if you take this away from me, I'll give you my life one day. And immediately, the power of God filled that hallway in this hotel room like I had never, ever felt in my life. The love and the peace that I had never known was tangible. It was perfect utopia. It's as if you had taken me from a freezer where I shivered to death and put me in the most cozy atmosphere of love and absolute serenity. I was in absolute awe in the presence of the Lord. I didn't even know how big it was. It was just absolute perfection. I got up from there. I hovered. I, didn't, I, I walked into my hotel room, and I was just basking in the presence of the Lord for the first time. But I had such a bitter taste for religion that I didn't surrender my life right there. You'd think I'd have just got saved and start witnessing. I remember being in a crack house one time in a basement of this dungeon. People were shooting up, and... It was a dark, dark place. It was a hellhole. And I remember the Spirit of God came over me. And I'm all stoned and drugged, and 
I'm in the corner just leaning on it. It is, like, I mean, it's a horrible place. And I felt this, this spirit come on me. It was, just, it was not like me. I said, hey, dudes, God can change your lives, man. Dead silence in the party. It was like I said, I raised this joke in a black party, you know. And dead silence. And everybody's like, oh, man, Donald's losing it. He's freaking out. They thought I was overdosing or something, right? And I said, no, guys, God can really change our lives. And I remember one boy got up, and he walked right up to me. He says, if you give God your life, I'll follow you. I'm not even saved, and I'm witnessing. And Christians can't witness? I'm a drunkie. I'm sitting in the midst of nowhere, and I'm obedient to God. It's funny. And, you know, one day... Oh, yeah, I'm in this, I, I, this guy owed money, and I owed money, and I wanted to settle this debt, so I hired two hitmen, and we started looking for this guy, and I lost him. I found him the second time in this biker's club, so I walked in there, grabbed him by the shirt, and threw him in the arms of these two guys I had hired, and they pulled him in the back alley. This guy fought for his life, and we, the two guys, they had fists like this wide, and they just punched the lights out of him. The guy, his face was beyond recognition. He just dropped to the ground, and one guy said, it's enough. And I thought the guy had died, and the whole club emptied. And here I was strutting in pride, and I remember walking away from this scene thinking, I've reached the pinnacle of my career. And I was about 150 feet away when they started screaming at me, you're barred for life. And for me, heaven was like a big piece of steel where I, there was no contact between me and God. God. I feared God, but I thought he'd have nothing to do with a guy like me. In that very moment, I felt heaven un unravel, just like, like a scroll, and I felt completely naked. I literally walked like this, like, leave me alone. I felt God's eyes follow me wherever I went. The conviction of God was so heavy on me, I couldn't get away from it. So one day, I'm human trafficking in, in, in this town, and I... Uh, I'm going to drop off this girl downtown, and I'm going to go to the player's bar where all the, the pimps are hanging out. I get into this taxi, and, and there's this, I mean, this ugly guy was driving this taxi. He was so ugly. It was incredible. He had a nose like an avocado, and, and he was driving me. And I, he says, where are you going? I said, I'm going to the club, right? I said, just drop this girl downtown. And he kept looking at me in the mirror like that. I mean, look at that. So he kept looking at me like that, right? So I... Uh, I was like a little angry at him for looking at me like that, right? So I dropped off this girl, and he's driving me to the club, right? And all of a sudden, it got beyond him. I, for the first time in my life, man, I didn't meet a religious dude. I met a disciple of Jesus. I'll show you the difference. This guy met me where I was. So he looks at me in the mirror. He says, hey, boy, you know the way you live is the way to destruction? <laughs> Talking to me? <laughs> so I, 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 had, I was a guy with a very few words, unlike today. My wife converted me, and I, I didn't want to answer him. And then he just looked at me like this with his nose, right? And I thought, <laughs> so, I mean, this thing is like, mm, right? So, I, I don't know if it, that, that nose gave him the compassion. I don't know what it was, but I, I decided I want to answer him, right? And I said, yeah, I know that. So, he says, you know, boy... He says, I used to be in the mafia. He says, I drank 26 ounces every night. And he says, my wife was a prostitute in Los Angeles. And he says, one day Jesus Christ got a hold of my life. And he says, he changed me completely. He says, I, he says, I, I run a little church just down the road. He says, you should come there tonight and give your life to Jesus. I thought, how do I get rid of this guy? So I said, you know what? Even if I go to your church tonight, I can't get saved there. He said, why is that, boy? I said, because I got a praying mother in Montreal, and if I want to get saved, that's where I got to go. He says, you're right. He says, if you come to my church, he says, you can't get saved. I said, what's wrong with you? He says, I'll make a deal with you. He says, I'm going to drive you to the airport right now, and I'm going to buy your airfare. Wow, i never seen this man in my life. He's ugly like sin, but he's got something that I desire. He's got this compassion of Jesus that I had never seen in religion. 
I'm in the back seat, just, no, this is not happening to me, get out of here. I was so convicted. I, I started looking for lines, like, how do I get rid of this guy? I said, uh, dude, I can't take your offer, man. I got to go to court. I did this crime, and I got to go to court, and I got to, I'm, I'm, I just, he said, that's okay. It's okay. He said, I just, I want you to know that I'm here for you. See, most religious people, say, oh, you got to come to my church. It's the only church. It's the best church. He didn't do that. He just said, it's okay. I just want you to know I'm here for you, man. So he dropped me off at the club, right? And I get out of the car, and I get into this club, and all the players are there, and I, for the first time in my life, I felt like I was walking in the wrong place. I walk all the way to the, to the bar, and I sat down. I drank cognac, and the bartender, they knew me. He said, what are you going to have tonight? I said, nothing. I couldn't even order my drink. I was so convicted. You see, when you do it the right way, you convict people. He could have said, no, you're going to hell, boy. You're going to die in your sins. He was right. He's doing the right thing the wrong way. He went about it as a disciple of Jesus Christ with love and compassion. And he convicted me. I walked out of that bar and I went home and I told that girl, I said, you know what? I said, this guy today freaked me out. <laughs> I said, I got to change my life, man. I started telling people, I want to change my life. I went to court, told the judge, I'm changing my life, man. I told everybody, I told the cops. The cops were after me all the time. They were busting into my hotel room every morning kicking me out of every town I was in, every hotel room. They kicked me out. But this little dude with the big nose convicted me because he had something desirable. And it wasn't in his face. It wasn't in his structure. It wasn't in anything. It wasn't in his religion. It was in his compassion of the Samaritan. And he changed my life. Shortly after, I went back. And I told everybody, I'm changing my life. So I decided to buy a ticket. And I got on the train. I went to Montreal. And, and I, I started acting like a thug. And I went into bars and I started punching people. And the devil told me, get drunk for the last time. Because if you're going to live for Jesus, you can't drink no more. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's right. So I, I, I go into these bars and I'm drinking like a fish, right? And I, I had like 10% blood in my alcohol. And... <laughs> So I'm going to live it up, and I'm in Montreal, and my brother's with me. He's in the Navy. He's all ashamed, right, because I went to, the, to, the, to where he was at in the Navy, right, and all the guys are putting bids on like, I bet you he's this. I bet you he's that, and my brother's all ashamed because they're bidding that I'm the, probably the worst character they've ever, like, they're, they're, they're trying to, they're bidding on what I am, who's right, right? So I'm telling them right out, I say, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a pimp, man, I'm this, and my brother's, what are you talking about? Aren't you ashamed? I, I wasn't ashamed. I wasn't ashamed. You should be so ashamed, but you're not because sin will take you way further than you want. So here I'm in Montreal living like a dog, and, and I didn't want my mom to know that I was there, right? I'm going to live it up, and I'm going to drink probably till I'm almost dead and then give my life to Jesus, right? So I, I'm at the Greyhound station, right? And, uh, oh, man, I have some stories I want to tell you. I'm not going to tell you. It's just, you guys... You never forget it, but I'm at the Greyhound station, and there's a lady from my mom's church. She comes face to face with me. She'd have never recognized me because I look like something the cat drug in, right? But she recognized my, my little brother, and my brother's like, hey, that's Donald. And she looked at me. Oh, my word. Anyways, so I said, oh, now she's going to go to the church and tell my mom that I'm in town, and I didn't want to hurt my mom anymore. So I get in. My brother says, okay, get on the bus. I, went, I got on the bus, and I had all these pimp chains around my neck, right, because I, I looked like a pimp. And so I'm, I said, I want to go into this church, and I want to show the, all the people I grew up with what I've become, right? Because I'm still arrogant. And I'm getting off the bus in front of the church. It was a city bus. And, and then God spoke to me. You're not going in there like, looking like a Christmas tree. You're going to go into the little apartment building right next door, and you're going to strip yourself of the things that identify you to your sins. And whoa. It was so powerful. God would speak to me, and I would listen more than most Christians. So I went, and I stripped myself of all that trash, and I walked into church, and they preached my whole life. They preached my whole life, and I'm like, wow. It was funny, because in that church, there was a lot of older people, right? Not like here. You guys are all young and fresh. But and you know when you walk into an older church, and everybody's older, and, 
So I walked, I sat in the back, right? And then you can see like a domino effect. Donald's here, Donald's here, Donald's here. And then all of a sudden, I saw my, I saw my mom's head go. It got to her. But you know, the music, how does it work? That, 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 what do you call that game there that you say something and it, the musical chair? Anyways, I don't know what she got by the time she got the message, but she turned around in disbelief, it's him. See, I would never call home. Because if I called home, my mom would talk to me about Jesus. So if your kids don't call home, it's not because they hate you. It's because they're afraid of you. <laughs> they're afraid of the God you serve. And I was afraid that she would persuade me, so I wouldn't call home. I'd call once a year or something, you know, and whatever, whatever occasion, right? And I'd say, can't she talk about anything else, you know? So here I'm in the church, and the sermon just revealed my whole life. So I started getting really convicted and... And, and my mom didn't want me in her house. I mean, who wants me in their house? I mean, I'm not a trophy here. I, I, I mean, I was, I'd smoke sometimes up to two packs a day, and I drank like a fish, and I was a, a horror show. So my mom, I could see her, she goes to the front, right? And this church was so conservative. I mean, I stuck out like a sore thumb, right? And uh, she walks to the front, she goes up to the preacher. And then I hear the preacher go. So I walk out, right? So I'm, I'm outside, and I'm thinking, my mom's going to come out and say, you look like a dirt bag, you know, you stink, and whatever. I thought the worst of it. And for some reason, this conservative church got it for a short period of time. My mom walks out, and she says, do you want to come home tonight? I just about lost it. My mom's inviting me to her house. I had a duffel bag full of everything, weapons, and alcohol. It was all in there. And I was so frail at this point. I had lost weight for nine months. I couldn't hold food in my stomach. So I picked up my bag all frail, and I put it on my back, and I got into the car. And I mean, my mom's scared to death, right? And she took me home because the preacher said, give your boy a chance. So I went home, and I went. They had, they, these guys had church overdose. We had four services a week, and I went to every one of them. And you know what? It was hellfire preaching. And that little preacher, she weighed about 96 pounds, and she would hit that platform, ouch, and, <laughs> and it would just resonate and echo in the church. She was, this woman was on fire. So anyways, I went in there, and that, the sermons would hit me right between the eyes, and I would not get mad. I would take it in, and I'd say, that's for me, that's for me, that's for me. I'd come home at night and take something out of my bag and throw it out. And my mom would usually keep it cool. She wouldn't say anything. She never looked in my bag. She never did anything. The anointing of the Holy Spirit hit that church, folks. The revival hit that church. It took it out of its conservative boundaries, and they did everything right. You see, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. The big problem in church is there's a lack of unity, and that's why people aren't getting saved, because that Jesus says the house divided against itself shall not stand. You have no idea. These people would raise their hands in the air and praise Jesus all together, one accord. The music that would come out of that, remember that, Mom? <laughs> wow. People say, I, we don't want to do this in church because we're going to scare this sinner away. No, you're scaring them away not doing it. I was so drawn to this supernatural the power of God would just hit that because it was a unison of spirit. So I'm there in the back. I know I'm not right, but I want, I want this. What's wrong with these people? They look stupid, but I want this because they all looked so different than me, right? I thought I looked good, but I didn't. You see, I was contaminated by the world, and the only thing that will decontaminate you is the spirit of the living God the water, the spirit, the blood, and I didn't have that yet. So I'm in this service, every service, I was there, and I would sit at the tip of my seat and just devour every word because it's the word of God that changes people. So one day, my mom got religious on me. She wouldn't allow me to smoke in the house. She'd say, you stink, and I, 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 I could take that, you know? My mom telling me I stink. But one day, I don't know what got into her. She says, every time you go outside to smoke, it's as if you're meeting the devil. I lost it. I was furious. I walked out of that house. Boy, I slammed that door off the hinges. And I went out there. Yeah, I hope she gets run over by a truck. I was so mad. And I lit my smoke. And I mean, I, was a, I smoked like Rene Levesque. I mean, I was a chain smoker. And 
I lit my smoke and I'm just choked. And all of a sudden, I took two, three puffs out of this thing. My whole body went numb from head to toe as if I had never smoked in my life. I got nauseated. I was sick like a dog. And I'm dizzy and I'm against a wall like this and I hit my head against the wall. I couldn't even feel my head. This is how I was, as if I had never smoked in my life. Wow, the Holy Ghost panic hit me, eh? So I took my cigarette and I threw it in the snow. And I walked back in. Boy, I was defeated. I closed the door softly. I said, Mom, something happened to me. She said, what's, what's that? She said, I said, I feel like I've never smoked in my life. And then she kept it. She, she didn't say a word. I took my pack of cigarettes. I'd never done this in my life. I crushed it and I threw it in the garbage. Man, I never did that in my life. When I ran out of cigarettes, I'd smoke the tea. I'd smoke tea bags. And so they had a meeting that night. It was a Saturday night. And I'll never forget it. I would, we had a little room. We'd have altar calls. I would go to every altar call. They were not long enough. I was the last one out of church. Last one. They would play that little accordion and the ukulele. And uh, I can't stand that. I can't see another accordion for the rest of my life. But... <laughs> And those, the anointing was on those songs, okay? <laughs> so it made up for it. <laughs> so they were playing that, and every, they had a little prayer room. So those who wanted to pray more could pray quietly with no distraction. I would be in there with my hands up in the air, screaming out to God, Lord, I want you. Do something for me. And here my father-in-law, which was a hitman in the mafia, he had gotten saved, right? And he was getting up and giving these booming testimonies. I mean, he was frothing at the mouth giving his testimony. And I wanted that. Not the frothing, but I mean, I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to, to, to say I got saved, right? And uh, so it really get, get me upset. So I'm in this prayer room this Saturday night, and I'm praying my heart out. And I said, God, I want to know you. I want to feel you. I want to know that I'm a new creature in Christ. I was hoping for a little wind, a little tear from the Virgin Mary's eye, you know, anything. But I wanted to feel something, and I'm not feeling it, and I'm getting frustrated, and I got mad at God. And I said, God, if I don't come out of here a new man, I'm coming out of here a dead man. And I was going to kill myself. I was fed up. See, me living in this, my, my body was a torment from morning till night. I remember going to court one time. I puked from my, my bedroom to the courtroom. I puked going up the stairs. I puked behind cars. I puked everywhere. This was a normal life for me. So I didn't want to live like that anymore. I was so tormented from morning till night, so mentally ill, I can't even describe it. That would take another meeting altogether. But I knew something had to happen. So I'm in this prayer room that night, and everybody emptied. I was the last one. I remember having those arms stretched out. Jesus, I want to know you. I want to know you. I didn't know how to pray, but I knew how to say that. And nothing was happening. So I walked out of that prayer room. I mean, it, I probably stayed in there for a good hour. I walked out of there. My mom, my sister was there, and, and another lady, we were giving a ride. She was at, uh, she had, anyways, she was there. And the preacher and the family was there. So I walk out, and I went up, and the preacher came and met me. And I said to the preacher, she, came, she shook my hand. I said, can you pray for me? I quit smoking today. The preacher said, yeah, I'll pray for you. And the moment that preacher laid hands on my head, the power of God came like a mighty rushing wind, I dropped to my knees and I started to weep. And I don't cry a little bit now, but I started to weep and weep and weep in the presence of the Lord. And I didn't know what was going on, but I knew something big was happening. The power of God came and the love and the peace that I had felt in that hallway of the hotel that day came in like a wind. And I said, just, I remember saying this, Jesus, do whatever you want with my life. And I got up. And as I got up, the power of God hit me a second time. And I started to laugh. I, it's like as if 150 pounds I rolled off my back. I'm holding myself like this, not laughing like a hyena, but I'm laughing in the presence of God in awe. I had never, ever in my life felt such awesomeness such freedom, such peace, this tangible love. I could literally eat it. 
it was just, I was laughing. So I went and hugged the preacher, broke her ribs, and I hugged my mother, and I knew I was saved the moment I hugged my sister. <laughs> my mom had the ugliest car on the planet. It was a, called a, a Pacer. It looked like an aquarium with wheels. And I got into that car, and I wasn't ashamed no more. And we drove off, and we're, my mom's singing gospel songs. I know I'm a little bit over my time, but it's okay. I'll make it up to you. And I, I was just basking in the presence of God. I went home that night, and for me, I couldn't sleep at night. I, I was tormented so heavily, and I went, and I just, I was hovering over my blanket. I was touching myself. Is this me? Is this possible? I was in absolute awe, and I went to bed with the most awesome, awesome peace. I woke up the next day, folks. I didn't walk the same. I didn't talk the same. I didn't do anything the same. I was completely transformed by the power of God, translated from darkness to light. I was walking in newness of light. I, I, I was incredible. And I just, my life, I, the next meeting it was a French meeting. And uh, I didn't like the French meeting so much. I don't know why. It's, certain things just don't sound good in French, especially preaching. <laughs> it's like listening to a Frenchman singing a country song. <laughs> Or a Korean guy singing Willie Nelson. <laughs> and I went in there, and I sat there, and I, I was sitting there, and all of a sudden, I didn't know the anointing. I I, I, anointing for me was probably like in a little thing of oil. I didn't know what it was. And all of a sudden, they, they're, they're getting up to give their testimonies. And my frothing father-in-law gave his testimony. I'm sitting there, and my shirt just started bouncing like this. And my heart was pounding out of my chest. I said, what's going on? Am I having an attack? And all of a sudden, Jesus told me, get up. I had never testified except for that crack house. So I get up, and I said in French, I said, I got saved last night. I didn't think there was that much joy. And I sat down, and the whole church broke out into praise. And I was completely changed, completely. And I was never the same since. People ask me, did you battle? Well, no, he fights for me. Do you want to go back? Why would, why would I want to go back? What's there to go to? I was, a, I, I was like completely transformed. You know, people say, I struggle with my past. I don't have a past. I have a future. Yes. Don't give me your garbage. The only thing Satan knows about me is the size of my shoes because he's under my feet. Yes. And the only power... Yes. The only power Satan has is the one you give the, the enemy. We have overcome because of the blood of the Lamb. And I have traveled, and I have witnessed, and I got down on my knees a couple of years ago, and I said, Jesus, I want to touch more lives this year than I've ever touched in my whole entire life. And like most Christians, I didn't think Jesus would listen. And that year, I witnessed over 4 million people. And I am not ashamed to proclaim Jesus and his love, and his compassion. And it, my life is completely different. I went back coast to coast, and everybody I robbed, everybody I hurt physically, emotionally, everybody I've touched in my past, I went back face to face and told them Jesus had changed me. It was incredible. People forgave me. People would say, is that you? Is that you? I'd say, it is, but it's not, because I'm a new person. I'm not the man I used to be. Remember that song? I am not the same I used to be. See, I believe in the old time religion. I believe in the gospel that delivers you from your sin. I believe in being saved from sin, not in sin. I believe that there's a complete transformation. Can I tell you just one more story? I was doing restitutions one day, and uh, I, had, I used to take my motorcycle in this guy's house up the stairs, and can you imagine me? I was renting this beautiful house, and my dog had eaten every blade of grass, and everybody was afraid like, to, to protest us, and I had moved out and just trashed the house. I had drug dealers living downstairs. They stabbed the doors. They emptied their ashtrays everywhere. They broke the house to, to frazzle, and I moved out. The guy didn't pursue me. He was so scared. It was an old Hungarian man, and uh, after I got saved, I went across Canada. We held meetings, and I, I invited every people on the street to come and see that, meet the Jesus I knew. 
and it was just incredible. And, and the places would the packed, and, and they just wanted to see how God can change such a moron like me, right? And I remember hearing people saying, talking to my mom that day, they'd say, I can't believe he's, I can't believe that's him. And my mom, you know, these two old ladies were crying and stuff. And I thought, that's cool, eh? They're crying because of me. And, and it was just so beautiful. And I remember um, his name was Mr. Dolber. And I, I phoned him up and I said, Mr. Dolber, can I come and see you? And he didn't know anything, right? So he, he said, yes. I knew his address and everything. So I went over there and I'm wearing a double-breasted suit. And it was the style back then. And... Uh, I took my mom with me so he wouldn't stone me, and it made me look better anyways. I thought it did. Anyways, uh, so I knocked on his door, and I said, uh, Mr. Dolber, I says, I, I'd like to pay the damages I did to your house. And his wife's at the top of the stairs, you know, and she's looking all fearful, and you know, they look at me, and I'm different, you know. And uh, I said, Jesus Christ just changed my life, and I want to make restitutions. I want to pay you the damages I did to your house. And he said, no, he said, that's okay. I was poor like a doornail, right? And I, I said, I insist. I want to pay the damages I did to your house. And he said to me, he shook his head and he had big tears in his eyes. And he said, no. He said, it would be way over your head. He said, just to see you today, the way you are, dressed and in your right mind, he said, that's good enough for me. And, you know, it was just incredible. It was, people say, it must have been hard to make restitution. I'll tell you what's hard is not doing it. Today, I could go to bed and sleep like a baby. No one's going to come and haunt me. I don't run from the enemy. The enemy runs from me. I don't have to watch my back, you know, because I'm free. I'm free. And, and whom the sun sets free right. is free indeed. Yeah. And, and I'd like us to, you know, if you have kids or family or people, if you want freedom from anything in your life, I'd like to pray with you. Is that okay? You guys can come to the front and we'll pray together. Mike, you can help me. And our sister that plays a little music to soften up the heart. I think, you know, it'd be awesome if we prayed as a church even and, and got up and just got together and prayed for one another. Isn't that, a, do you think that's a good thing to do? I, I think, you know, there could be such liberty and I think, you know, if we get together collectively as one church and, 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 and just pray for one another, we can see breakthroughs in our families and, and depression and oppression and addictions that shouldn't be in our lives sometimes. I had a girl come up to me on time. I was holding a meeting with Mike Zachman, and she come up to me, and she says, uh, I'm addicted to, I thought, what's she addicted to? She looked like a glamour girl. She says, I'm addicted to reading books. Well, I says, you're not addicted to reading books. You have an emptiness in your life that needs to be filled. Nothing wrong with books. So we need to find balance, even in our, in our disciple life. And I'd like to, us to pray together. So we're going to pray and, and get together and, and, and just love one another. Lord, I thank you so much for your presence here today. I thank you for this ministry. I thank you for the blooms, Lord. Lord, I know you've put us together for a reason. And Lord, I just pray today that we can... Pour our hearts to you for a few minutes, Lord, and just absorb what you have for us. Lord, I thank you so much for what you've done in my life, Lord, and I just pray that the church will rise up, Lord, and serve you with all their hearts. So, Lord, we commit ourselves into your hand right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Mm -hmm.